Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you today. Thank you, Pastor John Andrew. My name is Matt Shackelford. I'm the lead teaching pastor, and it's a joy to ask you to take your Bible, and let's open in God's Word to Luke. We're going to be in chapter 5 today, Luke chapter 5. As you're turning there, how many of you remember uh, having one of these in your, your car, um, a cell phone that looked something like that? I was on the phone with a uh, business executive guy. He was in the business world, that kind of guy, and he was telling me the story of uh, back in the 90s, I suppose. It would have been back in the 90s when this was getting popular. It was unthinkable that you could actually make a phone call from your car. Can you believe it? This was amazing technology, and people, businessmen, were having this installed into their car. I remember what this looked like, and they had the hands-free feature you plugged the phone into. And he was telling me about the time when he, he got that done, and his business paid for it. And so he had one of these in his car, and a coworker jumped in the car and saw it and said, Let's, this is amazing. You can call somebody from your car. Let's try it out. So he called his boss, and he left his boss a message and, and hung up, and, and it, worked, it worked unbelievably well. But uh, then after he hung up, he went on to, to really fillet his boss. Worst guy I've ever worked for. You all know where this is going. <clears throat> I don't like anything about this guy. His leadership, his work ethic, his haircut, what a jerk. And after a couple minutes of that, the voice came over the speakers, if you're happy with your call and your message, please press one. And both of them sort of scrambled, realizing what had happened for the phone and the console and the message sent. Now, two things happened after that moment. The guy who was driving, the phone, who the phone belonged to, he just exploded in laughter and couldn't stop laughing at all. And the other guy didn't appreciate that at all. But the blood drained from the guy uh, who had just filleted his boss. Uh, he felt the weight of that. His gossip, his slander, he felt that brokenness that came from a broken relationship that he just blew up. Now, I don't know about you, but, but maybe you've had an epic failure in your life, and uh, maybe have you ever had one of those moments where you've, you've had a sin, an event, uh, something has happened in your life that was so bad, it feels impossible to recover from. Have you ever had one of those? I think we all have. Somebody said amen extra loud. Amen. We all have. Uh, our sin actually breaks relationship, and, and really that's the story of humanity before God. We have a broken relationship with our Creator, God. Our sins create this, this awkward barrier between our Creator. It breaks the relationship, and there are moments in my life where I feel that broken fellowship. That's what sin does. It, it destroys, it chips away at, at, at relationship that man was meant to experience with God. And so what happens is because of our sin, we live with uncertainty and guilt and fear, it's brokenness. I had a counselee one time, 55 years old, and, and they were still haunted by something they did in high school, and they kept asking the question, could God really forgive me? And they've spent most of their adult life wondering, could I really be fixed in my relationship with God? Some of that's false guilt. Some of that is not truly understanding and believing the gospel. Some of that is, is not, some of that is just, just bad teaching. It's just legalism that you're accepted by your deeds. And we had to work through all that. But I think that's a great picture of all of humanity. We want to be accepted by God, and we don't fully understand how that acceptance comes. And oftentimes what happens is, like the sermon last week, we try to work our way to God. We're that guy walking down the aisle with bloody knees from his village, going miles and miles on our knees to try and, to try and earn salvation. Many of you, that's, that's the thing you've fallen into. You're, you're a good little girl or boy, and you tuck in your shirt, you comb your hair, and you try to be good to earn it. And that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. That is not how we fix our brokenness. You can't earn it. You can't ignore it. You can't try to do better. You can't medicate it. And oftentimes, we just try to do whatever we can to feel better. I got to be honest with you. After a hard day, two scoops of Bluebell ice cream will just about do it. Amen? <laughs> That'll just about medicate anything. 
This is week three of our sermon series, Defining Moments. In week one, I challenged you that you need to think about your life as full-time ministry. You are in ministry. All of us are in ministry. Every single one of us need to live our life that way. You need to make the decision. You are a minister of the gospel. Wherever your life takes you, wherever your feet carry you, you need to think of life that way. And we saw that in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And then last time we got together and we talked about cleansing, that there's no closeness without cleansing. You can't cleanse yourself. You need Jesus to do this for you. You see, we're all in one big leper colony. All of us are filthy before a holy God, and we need to fly to the fountain that would cleanse us. His name is Jesus Christ. You cannot cleanse yourself but Jesus can do this for you, and you need to trust Him, not your goodness, not your deeds, not your own ability. You need to trust in Christ. He can wash you and cleanse you. Today we're looking at a fun story. This is a, this is a great passage. It's one of those that you Sunday school grads uh, grew up on. It's the one where the guy gets lowered down through the ceiling. Isn't that a great story? Um, we're going to experience not just healing, but spiritual healing. And that's the deeper aspect of this story. It's not primarily about a guy who has lameness and he's, he's healed from his lame body. It's actually about him having forgiveness of his sins before a holy God. And we're going to see that today. And, and so, some of you are lame. I just want to say that. And I don't, what I don't mean by that is that you need a better quality of dad joke, all right? Um, you are spiritually broken, in your relationship to God. And what you and I need is to come to Christ who can make us whole and heal us. And so, let's take our Bibles. Let's stand as we do every week. In honor of God's holy Word, we're in chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to read verse 17 to 26 this morning. It says this, On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Let's remember that phrase. We're going to return to that. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed and were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin, sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, He answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk, or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Amen. I don't know if you've been following on social media before we sit down, but there's this craze that's happening on Instagram and Twitter called, Is It Cake? And they put up these objects, and they take a knife and cut into it. They look so real, and they decide whether it's really cake or not, and they find out whether it's really cake or not. And I was amused by that. Uh, over the past couple of weeks because there's all these random objects they cut into and it turns out to be cake. And I think about that with this story. A lot of us come to a story like this, this guy who's, who's raised or lowered down into this house and we get confused. We think, well, this is really about a guy getting healed or a guy getting a, a miracle and we miss the greatest miracle of all. The greatest miracle of all is not being healed from leprosy or healed from lameness, the greatest miracle of all is having our sins forgiven before a holy God. I mean, that is the greatest miracle that holy God does for sinful man in the whole Bible. He, he forgives the, the massive wrath that was weighed against us by a holy God. And today we're going to see how God does that, and we're going to notice that only Jesus, only Jesus 
not your goodness, not your good deeds, not any other path, not… There is no other path to having your sins forgiven. Only Jesus takes us from sorrow to celebrating. He is the one sacrifice, the one who can forgive sins that God accepts. And so, may God bless the preaching of His Word this morning. You may be seated. How do, how do we go from sorrow to celebrating? That's a great question. Some of you are here with sorrow. Some of you are here feeling the weight of separation, the weight of sin on your life. How do we go from sorrow to celebrating? That's what I want to answer. If you're taking notes this morning, uh, I would encourage you. You can do that on your app. You can do that uh, on the, the handout that's provided. And in the coming weeks, we're going to have a bulletin. That's coming back. We're really excited about relaunching that. And so, you'll be seeing that in the coming weeks. I have three points for you to, to make notes on and to, to record today. Number one, number one, first, we need to seek Jesus to heal extraordinary sorrow. Seek Jesus to heal extraordinary sorrow. Two very fundamental foundational points that I want you to see this morning on this first point. Uh, life is full of sorrow. Life is full of sorrow. Jesus is full of healing. Amen. That's it. That's the whole point that I want you to see, this first one. Life is full of sorrow. That's a sermon in and of itself. Life is hard. We all know that. We all feel that. We feel the weight of it in, multiply, in multiple different ways. First of all, we have to answer that question, why is life so bad? Well, in the garden, we sinned. Adam and Eve sinned, and they separated themselves from their life source. They cut themselves off from blessing. A curse entered into humanity, and you can go to Romans chapter 8, very interesting passage that we read, uh, a little commentary on what's going on. It says that the creation, the creation was subjected to futility. That's a fun word. Everybody say the word futility. Everybody say the word futility. That's a fun word. What, what does it mean? Futility. It's frustrated. It's, it's not working the way it was supposed to work. We feel it in our soul as we walk through life. Every disappointment, every sickness, every disease, every loss of a child and miscarriage, every, every single funeral I've ever been to, I have felt that word, futility. We're caught up in entropy. We're caught up in decay. Creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. So you see, God subjected creation to decay and futility, and, the, and He did this in hope. There's, even, there's a hope there that one day that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. There's some very important words in this passage, very vivid words, childbirth, pains, groaning, bondage, corruption, futility. Those are, those are very powerful words, and we feel them, don't we? Yeah. We feel every single one of them. One day, the curse will be removed. We long for that day, but until then, we are living under a curse, and, and this is God's picture of what sin brings. Sin is awful. Sin brings decay. Sin brings destruction. In Romans 1, we understand that God's very punishment for sin is more sin. It's awful. He gives us over to our sin to help us understand how bad it truly is, and we all feel it. There are funerals and miscarriages and loneliness and depression and fear, and, and dear friends, that is the condition, and really there's no escaping that condition in this life. We're living under a curse. Look at verse 17 in our passage. Notice the, the universal need. This, this need, this feeling, it hits every social class. We highlighted a few. Not only are there those in the city of Capernaum coming to Jesus for healing. That's what we saw last week. The leper couldn't keep his yap shut, right? He couldn't keep his mouth closed, and he, he told everybody, and people started coming to him from everywhere. Now they're really coming to him on one of those days. Those days when Jesus was in that area healing people and people started streaming to Him as He was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. Jesus is gaining in popularity. He's a rock star at this point. People are finding out this one has the power to heal. And notice, I want you to see, we have, in addition to the townspeople coming, now we have Pharisees 
And teachers of the law, that's going to become very important for next week. Very important next week. We'll see that. And they're coming from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. Now, I, I believe that in chapter 5, we're starting to see hints of, of really the antagonism of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is where it really gets going. This is where they really start to decide, we don't like this guy. I, 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 they start to stand in the way of his ministry. They start to suspect him. They start to, 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 to really turn against him. We start to see the, the starting of that in chapter 5. But more than that, I really think this is highlighting also just the desperation the world lives in. This is a world of sorrow. Everyone is looking for God's Messiah. Everyone is looking for someone to bring healing. Notice the links that they will go to. They're traveling from Jerusalem. Let's put a map up on the screen. Interesting. Jerusalem's a good ways away from Capernaum up here at the top by the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Uh, If you went straight through it, that was a shortcut, but most law-observing Jews would go around Samaria, and that was a good distance. They are willing to travel in order to find out, is this someone that can provide healing from my sorrow, relief from my sorrow? We get that. You get that. If one of my kids has cancer, if one of my kids has some disease, we're going to the hospital. We're going to St. Jude's. We're going to somewhere else. We're going to get whatever doctor will give us the best chance of healing and hope. We're going to travel. We're going to drain bank accounts. I remember when my wife Ashley was sick, we had a long season where uh, Western medicine wasn't working, and we would go to doctors in Colorado, and we just weren't getting better. And we just started trying crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, we just started doing the infusions, and we started, like my wife had this long season of just going crazy on essential oils. I never, I never thought I would get the smell of frankincense out of my clothes. And like, I smelled like a Catholic church at my house. It was just all the time, and, and I can still smell it like right now in those memories. We would try anything. We were desperate, and we would hear little rumblings like, hey, maybe this doctor over here, they really helped me. Maybe they could help you. And we would drive from California to Colorado, and we would go to see this doctor, this miracle doctor, and they'd have us do weird stuff. And we'd be like, okay, that guy was a quack. That didn't work. And we, but, but I get it. We would try anything. You would too. The painting of life, at the the pains of life, I should say, sorrow makes you desperate for healing. You'll travel any distance, you'll do anything. And this is really painting for us the backdrop of sorrow and desperation. And, and, And there's reason for people to really travel a great distance here. In the past, past passages, we've seen Jesus is able to heal demons, or or cast out demons, I should say. He's able able to to cure someone with leprosy, something that hasn't been done since the time of Elijah, Elisha, something that hasn't been done at that point until the time of Moses. I mean, only twice in all of the Old Testament was leprosy ever cured. Someone like that is among us. Word is getting out. What do they see? Look at verse 17. They see that the power of the Lord was with him to heal. That word power, very interesting. The word dunamis, it's, it's used previously. We need to go back a chapter, but we start to see that word showing up in Luke's gospel. And what it says in chapter 4, verse 14, is that the, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Th- this ministry that Jesus was doing was not like David Blaine magic on the street, right? This wasn't like shenanigans. This wasn't like the, the, the like the Todd White leg growth stuff. This was, this was like real power, like demons are being cast out. Leprosy is being like healed. This is real. This is, this is not, this is not like, like, hey, let me show you this crystal, or hey, this is, you know, this isn't like voodoo. This is, this is real. It says the power of, of God was with him. God was powerfully working in his ministry and it was obvious this was the real deal. Those four friends, they see the power of God at work. And notice in verse 18, it says, some men. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And, and they were seeking to bring him and lay him before Jesus. But finding no, no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed. This is a great story. Man, this is fun. 
Um, there's a lot of fun stuff here I just want to show you for a minute. Uh, notice there's a dichotomy between the crowd and these four men, and we're going to see that really strong in the next, uh, next week and this week. Um, these men are doing what no one else is doing. It's really the religious people, the scribes, the Pharisees, those are the guys in the way. It's always the religious people who are in the way. The law keepers, those guys are always in the way. They're evaluating Jesus. They're suspecting Jesus. They don't, they're just complaining and criticizing and not contributing. They don't care about this man. And they, they serve as really a foil for these four men and their lame friend. They're just criticizing Jesus. Oh, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know if this guy's the real deal. I hear he makes wine. I hear he's got a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I, I, just, I just suspect him. I don't know if he's the real deal. And, and they're, all they're doing is just poking holes in this potential Messiah. They don't, they don't like Jesus, but they're certainly not letting him in the house not letting the lame man in. Notice five qualities of these four men who believe Jesus can heal. First of all, they're creative. Love this. They're creative. Uh, he's stuck in bed. No problem. We'll carry you on your bed. That's not a problem. Can't get in the house. No problem. We'll cut a hole in the roof. No, I mean, we'll get you there. No problem at all. We'll make a pulley system. We'll lower you down. And, and, and I just have to imagine like the service. Jesus is like in the room teaching. And, and as he's teaching, like stuff starts falling down. And, and I don't know about you, I get easily distracted. Like if something like that were to happen, like I'd be looking up and I'd, I don't know, did they stop the sermon? I don't know what happened. But, but he, they lower him down through the roof. This is amazing. And back then, the roof was uh, actually, that would have been quite a project. I'll show you a picture of what this could have looked like. There was a good deal of material, about a foot, and it was earthen material with twigs and other things inter, interlaid, and sometimes even grass would grow on the roof. And so they had to do a little excavation, some digging to create a hole big enough to drop this guy down. It was quite a project, but, but really there was no stopping them. They were creative. They refused to be stopped. Uh, it's interesting, Ashley and I were at the Billy Graham Retreat Center last year, and we toured the chapel, and in that chapel, they were talking about the different crusades. And some of you, how many of you went to a Billy Graham crusade in your lifetime? Uh, how many of you brought someone to a Billy, or, or were brought to a Billy Graham crusade in your lifetime? Yeah, a lot of you. You know what they said? They, they actually, they said that three-quarters of the people who were saved at those crusades were brought by someone. I found that very interesting. They were brought by someone. They were, they were pulled in, and they were taken there. These guys are creative, and it, it begs the question, who are we bringing to Jesus? Who are we being creative to pull in where the preaching of God's Word is happening into your community group, into your shepherd group, into your circle so that they can hear the gospel? Who is God calling you to be creative and bring to hear the gospel? That's very important. We had a guy get baptized last year, and he brought all of his friends. He brought all of his, his, his co-workers, everybody in his life circle, many of them unbelievers. He just brought them to church because he knew they would hear the gospel. He was bringing them. He was getting creative. You and I need to live in that place of creativity. How do we get our lost friends to the one who can bring healing? That's a great question. Think about that. What am I doing to bring my lost friends to a place where they can be healed in their relationship to God? What am I doing? Be creative. Be creative. Second, notice they were urgent. In verse 19, I love this, into the midst before Jesus. They just, they just took him right in there, lowered him right in front of Jesus. They didn't wait for the meeting to end. They didn't try to, try to wait outside of the door. Uh, their life verse is 1 Corinthians, over in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the favorable time. Right now. They just dropped him right in the midst. We're going in. This guy's going to get it right now. Oh, if we lived that way. Today's the day. Today's the day for my lost family member. Today's the day for my lost coworker. Today's the day for my lost neighbor. Why do we need to live that way? Because you are not promised tomorrow. It's, it's, a, it's a practice of practical atheism that we assume we have tomorrow. You do not know, James says. James says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Life is short. 
I want to say this to all of you, those of you watching online, life is short. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know when they will stand before God. You do not know when you will stand before God. Therefore, there's an urgency to this ministry. Third, they were sacrificial. Look at verse 18. Bringing. They gave their time. They, they gave their energy, their talent, their treasure. They gave their, their, their attention. Notice also through the tiles. Whose roof was this? This was probably Peter's house. And as they're breaking his roof, he's got to be thinking, somebody's got to fix that. I got a hole in my roof. Um, this is this is reminiscent. When we did ministry on the West Coast, the West Coast is not like doing ministry in the Bible Belt. It's far different. For one, there's, there's very few churches, and the churches are much smaller, and the facilities are far less. In fact, when we had events, oftentimes we would throughout the week have to have things at our house just because of traffic problems, because we couldn't get to the church, because traffic was so bad. And so we would have 85, 90 people at our house. And I got to tell you, they destroyed our house every week. We'd find pizza on the wall. We would find cake ground into the carpet, and they would destroy it every week. And we had to start looking at our house like less of a museum and more like an outpost to reach people, like a missionary outpost. You've got to ask yourself that question. How do you view, are you sacrificial with your house, your resources? Do you view your house like a museum, like this pre-glimpse of heaven, this pre-taste of heaven, or do you see it as a, a tool to be used to reach people? to have people in and, and to sacrifice for people. I want to pause. We got the weekend event going on, uh, the, the, the winter thing as it's being called it by our youth ministry. Pastor Derek is doing a great job with that. Uh, he's, he's just really doing an amazing job with youth ministry. He's doubled uh, the youth group seemingly overnight. And um, he, they've grown. And this event that's happening, the winter thing, is an amazing event. But some of you have donated your houses to that event. They are going to destroy your houses, friends. I'm joking. They're not. They might. Um, but but put, the, put the nice things away and just look at it as my house is an outpost for the glory of God. My things. I love people, not stuff. Some people love stuff. Some people love money. And they use people. We want to be the kind of church that uses stuff and uses money and loves people. Sometimes to reach, you have to sacrifice. Sometimes to reach, you have to sacrifice. Let's live that way. Let's live that way. Number four, they were persistent. They were persistent. <laughs> these people, these four friends, they did anything they could to get this man there, didn't they? They didn't give up. They weren't detour, deterred by the crowd. It says they were seeking to bring him in. It's like they would not give up. A while back, I love this story, there was a guy on social media and he was banned from his, his local soccer stadium in Turkey. He was kicked out and uh, he, apparently he was a little too rambunctious of a fan. But uh, he, he rented a crane and, and from the parking lot lifted the crane up over the stadium and uh, got away with watching the big game. And I, I respect this guy. I do. You know why? He, he didn't give up. He was persistent, and he got to watch the game. I, I, and social media blew up with that one. What are you doing to continue to go after the people in your circles with the gospel? Have you invited them to church? Have you bought them a Bible with their name on it and given it to them as a serious gift? Hey, I just love you, and I wanted to give this to you. This book has the pathway to life in it. I want you to have this. Would you come to church with me this Sunday? I'll take you to breakfast before. I'll pick you up. I'll give you lunch afterwards. I'll take you to lunch. What are you trying to do to get them in discipleship and to reach them so that you can have the opportunity to share the gospel and share your story with them when you are on the lame mat? We've got to get creative and be persistent. That's what all of us need. And fifth, they had teamwork. They had teamwork. It's interesting in verse 18, it only says some men. However, if you go over to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 2 verse 3 says that there were four men. 
There were four, I mean, think about that. It's it's a four to one ratio to bring somebody to Christ. Isn't that interesting? It takes four believers, it takes four people to bring one to Christ. And I think that's a really good point for all of us. We gather here every week to be fed, to be equipped, also a little bit of strategy. How are we going to reach our neighbors? Like, this is what you can do. Do you realize what's happening on Friday at Central Church? Every Friday, we have this men's event at the butcher block where all these guys show up together. They invite their co-workers. They invite each other. And perhaps we can meet up, gather together, talk about the gospel, and eat a big greasy burger together. Doesn't that sound great? Like you need to do that. You need to, you need to be a part of that ministry and strategize together. How do we bring our friend to Christ together and share our story and our testimony together. We have church invite cards. We invite somebody realizing that it may be the fourth person that invites them that actually gets through to them. We do it together. We do it as a team. It takes a team. But this is the heart in this first point. These men are convicted that only Jesus has the power to heal humanity's sorrow. And we have to pause and ask, does each of us possess that same conviction? Are we convicted that Christ alone is the solution? These men were. The Pharisees weren't. This world is full of sorrow. Are you convicted of that? How will your life now match that conviction? How will your actions now display that conviction? Second main point, if you're taking notes, not only do do we need to seek Jesus to heal extraordinary sorrow, we need to believe that Jesus can forgive extraordinary sins. Only Jesus can forgive extraordinary sins. No amount of your doing, no amount of of your good deeds or your works will be accepted to forgive your sins. Now, I'm a little confused reading verse 20. Look at it. Verse 20, he says, when, it, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. I am very confused at that. Why are we talking about sin? The man came for healing, not sin uh, forgiveness, not forgiveness. Why are we talking about forgiveness? It would be like my son Caleb coming to me and say, dad, I'd like to buy a game. Uh, I need $20. And I said, son, here's a book. Congratulations. Dad, you're giving me something I'm not asking for. And that is a very real scenario at my household. <laughs> As a father, I, I love my son, and I want to give him the thing that he needs. At Christmas time, I, I, I did something a little devious. I bought him for Christmas a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, kid. Um, <laughs> I, it wasn't his main gift, all right? It was, but, but, but I... Uh, I, he needs to learn and he needs to earn. Like he needs to, he needs to have some things in his life. Like I know what he needs as a father, all right? Um, but I see some of that in what Jesus is doing here. He's giving this man something he's not asking for. It's possible. Uh, why would he do this? It's possible the injury was sin related. The text doesn't say that. We don't know that. But, but surely I can identify a little bit with this. Maybe let's not be Job's counselors on this, but it's a possibility. Maybe he became lame because of a recklessness or a sin in his life. Man, I know a guy in, uh, in Shreveport. We grew up together. Shreveport, Louisiana, we, we grew up together. He got into motorcycles, was acting really dumb on a motorcycle, had a wreck, wrapped his bike around something, and he ended up in a wheelchair, and he's just now starting to walk again. Man, that's… sometimes, yeah, we do stupid stuff, and it's possible. I mean, maybe this guy's like… his profession is roofing. They're pretty… he and his friends are pretty good at roofs, Right? Like, maybe he's a roofer, and he did something stupid, and he fell off the roof. Maybe. I I don't know. It doesn't say, so let's not go any further than that. But I think we can all identify with that. Some of us, maybe you were playing around with sin. Maybe sin wrecked you, hurt you, no one to blame but yourself, cheated on your wife, you lied to your boss, whatever. You're wanting some relief. You go to Jesus for relief, but Jesus perceives what you really need is forgiveness. What you really need is forgiveness. That's the greatest need. I think Jesus is giving this man the greatest need that he can't see. I think that Jesus is seeing that this man's greatest need was not functioning legs, but, but forgiven sins. And we see that in Matthew 18. You can look that verse up later. Matthew 18, verse 8, it says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. 
It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. What's that mean? Well, your ability to walk, your ability to do whatever is going to pale in comparison to your forgiveness on the day of judgment. That's the main thing. We need to start looking at life that way. The main thing that humanity needs, the main thing that everyone in this room needs is the forgiveness of our sins. Everything else is gravy, right? My friend Bill, um, he's in our our Thursday morning leadership class. We meet every Thursday morning, 6.15. We talk about theology. We have a great time together. And uh, my friend Bill will sometimes zoom in from Japan. He's a pilot. He's a good pilot. And I keep dreaming about the day when Bill is going to say, Pastor Matt, jump on the plane with me. I'm going to take you to eat some sushi in Japan. Uh, Some of you, that would be like your nightmare. That would be awesome for me. I love a little sushi and sashimi and all that good stuff. But uh, Bill is zooming in from Japan. Imagine that happens. Imagine I'm on the the flight with, with Bill But imagine something goes terribly wrong on that flight. He comes down the aisle, and he talks to me and says, Pastor Matt, the plane is going down. The engines are failing. We've got a couple minutes here. Good news. I've got parachutes, one for me and one for you. We're getting out of here. I'm I'm pretty thankful at that moment. But what if I said to him, you know, Bill, I was, I got to tell you, I'm really disappointed. I was really hoping that you would come down the aisle telling me about the spicy tuna roll, not about parachutes, all right? I was really hoping for a pillow or pretzels, not a parachute. That'd be ridiculous. Bill would look at me and he would say, what's wrong with you? That means the plane is going down. And I would say, Bill, you, you don't understand. I skipped breakfast this morning. It's an issue of value. I would need to see what's truly valuable, that in that moment, I need more than anything else, a parachute. And and in this thought, what this man needs more than anything else, more than his ability to walk even, is to be forgiven by God because life is short. Life is 60, 70, 80 years. Eternity is eternity. We miss that our greatest need is having our sins forgiven. Notice that Jesus doesn't forgive everyone universally. It's universalism. We don't believe that. Although that's what people will say to you. But Jesus forgives. God forgives. And they just assume that He forgives everyone universally. Notice the condition in verse 20. He saw their faith. He saw their faith. It's the first use of the noun pistuo in uh, Luke's gospel. That's a big deal. These people believe. The lame man's faith, I believe, is implied in that. He's obviously agreeable to being lowered down through the roof. He's in on this, I believe. But they're all believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think there's evidence here that they're believing that He's truly God. In fact, notice all the marks of deity in this text. By the way, some will say to you, Jesus never claimed, have you ever heard this? Jesus never claimed to be God. Have you heard that? People will say that. I was sharing the gospel with, uh, uh, with a Muslim, and they said to me, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus, that, that he was just a prophet. He was just a good person, just a good teacher. And I said, well, you really only have to go this far. Just ask the very simple question, why'd they kill him then? Like, just, if you can answer that one question, why did they put him on a cross? That's a a self-refuting statement. In fact, if you look at, if you write down John chapter 5, verse 18, it says this. It says, when the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. There you go. Truly God. And this text goes out of the way to show him, to display him as truly God. Look at it there. Look at verse 22. He perceived their thoughts. Look at verse 24. He calls himself Son of Man. Do you realize Jesus used that title over 80 times in the New Testament, Son of Man? That's a messianic title. It's from Daniel. In Daniel, we see the Son of Man coming in the clouds to receive his kingdom from the Ancient of Days. It's a title of deity. Jesus called himself that all the time. We also see himself he, call, he heals here in Himself. In Him, there's healing. In other words, one like Elijah is here. There's something special about this one. He heals. 
He also forgives sins. This is the big one, and, and we see that in verse 24. He has the authority to forgive sins. I could spend all day on this. No other person in history claims that. I mean, think about this. What does every other religion, what does every other guru, what does every other, other preacher or, or self-proclaimed Messiah say to do? Follow the list of rules, do the list of deeds, be good little girls and boys, uh, reform your actions. They always say, do this, do this, list, list, rule, rule, way of living, way of living. Jesus says, I can give you forgiveness. No list, no law, come through me. Jesus is far, far different. Jesus forgives. And the scribes sense the problem there, only God can forgive. Look at verse 21. The rules people, the legalists hate this. They despise this because they built their entire life and ministry on trying to earn acceptance before God. Verse 21, the scribes and Pharisees begin to question, saying, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Man, we're going to get into this next week. The scribes and the Pharisees, who are these people? Well, the scribes are the professionals. These are the, the scholars. They know lots of Scripture. They love to gather around them groups of people called Pharisees. Those are the middle class, very religious, thousands of these guys, um, but a smaller group in the whole scheme of the country. But they would gather these groups around them. You would pick your scribe to follow. You would follow their teachings. And there's more. We'll talk about that next week. But, but they're all all trying to bribe God for acceptance. They want religion. They don't want a relationship with Jesus. Luther, he said it so well, religion is the default mode of the human heart. That's very powerful. Jesus proves that, that it's only through a relationship with Him that you can have forgiveness. He says, which is easier to say? Which is easier to say? And really what He's, what he's not saying is what is easier to say. He's really saying which is easier to prove. Because this, forgiveness, that's a private transaction between man and God. That's a private transaction. Can't really, all right, you're forgiven. How do you prove it? So that he can prove it, he says, rise and walk. I've got the power to heal. I've got the power to forgive. And he proves it. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of you have blown up your life. You feel broken. You feel the separation between you and God, and God brought you to this service to hear one simple line in this sermon. God forgives the worst of sinners. God forgives the worst of sins. Not by your doing, not by your law keeping, not by your own goodness, not by your religion, but through God's Son, Jesus Christ, who came, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on a cross for our sins, was resurrected because the grave could not hold Him and the sacrifice was accepted. And He stands ready to forgive anyone who would come to Him. We've got to tell people that. It's the best news I've ever heard. He heals extraordinary sorrows. He forgives extraordinary sins. There's more forgiveness in His heart than there is sin in your heart. There's more forgiveness in His heart than there is sin in your heart. Lastly, Jesus offers extraordinary salvation. We need to testify to that fact. Testify that Jesus offers extraordinary salvation. This offer is available, and I wish I had a whole other hour to talk about His authority. Look at verse 24, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, pick up, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Luke has been establishing the authority of Jesus Christ up until this point. In chapter 4, he has authority to teach with authority. He has authority over demons. He has authority over disciples and creation. He has authority over disease. And now he has the authority to forgive your sins, Amen. which you feel. And notice when that happens, there's a show and tell that happens. You tell others. You show them that you have found forgiveness in Jesus. Look at verse 25. Notice he picked up what he had been laying on, his mat, his testimony. His mat becomes his testimony. And this guy's like, I mean, this is a great day. He's walking home. He's forgiven of all his sins. He's made right with God. He's carrying the very bed that he, walked, that he came in on as his testimony. And some of you need to start doing that. 
Man, when you talk to people, don't be ashamed to tell your story. This was who I was. Man, I was lost. I was in sin. I was a drunk. Man, I was, I was addicted to this. I was walking in this sin. I was, I was an adulterer. I was a pornographer. I was all of these things. This was my bed. This is where I was laying. This is what I was doing. Here it is. I'm not doing it anymore. Amen. He saved me, and he made me something new. We need to do a show and tell. We need to go out into the world and tell them our story. Do you realize that your testimony is the one thing no one can argue with? Like, man, I've been in conversations sharing the gospel. They will argue about the creation narrative. They'll argue about evolution. They will argue about Jesus. They'll argue about, about Scripture. They'll argue about everything. What they can't argue with is you saying to them, I was once this. Jesus changed my life. They can't, they can't argue that. Use your testimony. Go out this week. Give a show and tell. And we ought to worship Christ every single time we see a life that has changed. Notice verse 25. And all went home. They all went home. Glorifying God. And amazement, amazement seized them. Seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Jesus can heal you. That's what this message is all about. Maybe that's what you need to hear. Your distance between holy God and sinful man can be taken away, but you must come through Christ. He offers real forgiveness for real sin, for real problems, and real sorrow. And I'm not saying that physical healing won't come to you. I still believe God does miracles today. I believe God I believe God's the kind of God who, who passes out a whole lot of, uh, of, uh, of pillows on this flight. Amen? I think He does. I think He gives a whole lot of mercy to us along with the parachute. But even if your cancer never goes away, even if you don't get better, even if you don't get the house you were wanting or the job you were wanting or the amenities that you were wanting for this life, I've been forgiven, so I have it all. There's a movie that I, I, I saw recently. I don't know that I can recommend it. it I, I was shocked by how much profanity was in it. It's PG-13, but it's a movie called Get Low. And uh, it's the story of this, this hermit who, who really lived out in the wilderness years and years and years ago, 1930s. He's played by Robert Duvall. And uh, Robert Duvall plays this character. He throws his own funeral party. And highly unusual. You don't do that until you actually die. Well, he knew it was coming. He had had a heart attack, and he wanted to throw his own funeral party. And so he goes in to see the preacher, and the preacher uh, was named Gus Horton. And he puts a wad of cash on the table, and he lays it down. All right, Pastor Gus, it's time for me to get low. And the preacher says, well, what do you mean by that? I need to get down to business. I need a funeral. And he said, for who? For me. You're still alive, sir. You see the problem, right? Well, I need to get low, and I know it's a strange request, but, but what would you say about me at my funeral? Oh, a, a eulogy, says the pastor. Well, what would you want me to say? Well, Felix said, um, well, uh, what, say it to my face right here and right now. I want to hear it from you. What would you say? Well, I don't really know you, but the guy kept pressing, and he said, uh, well, there's stories all right, what stories? Well, people talk about who you are and who you are in the community. What kind of stories? I want to hear them. Well, sir, my mother used to say that gossip is the devil's radio. What matters is not what people think about you or your stories. What matters is that when you come to the end of your life, that you're ready for the next one. Have you made your peace with God? And Felix replied with two words, I've paid. And by that, the movie shows what he had done 40 years earlier. 40 years earlier, he had had an affair with a married woman. And the husband ended up killing that woman, his wife. House burnt down. A couple died. And ever since then, he had been living in the wilderness trying to pay God by living in seclusion, never having a family, never having children. He said, I've never held a baby, ever. 
and I've been in a prison of my own making. I'm trying to pay God for my broken relationship. The pastor looked at him with a measure of compassion. Mr. Bush, you can't buy forgiveness. It is free, but you have to ask for it. And I would add, in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. This is the defining moment of your life. It was the defining moment for that lame man. From sorrow and sin to salvation, only Jesus, only Jesus can take the broken from sorrow to celebrating. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you to respond to the Lord this morning. There are people waiting in the back to pray with you. If you need to pray, if you want to just right where you're at right now, you can pray. You can kneel down. You can ask for forgiveness right now. You can ask Jesus Christ to wash away all your sins. You can right now make the decision to stop trusting in your works and believe in Jesus Christ and become a Christian. Are you broken? Are you overwhelmed with sorrow in your heart? Are you overwhelmed with this life? What you need to do is repent, look away from yourself, and look to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Trust Him today. And for those of you who are Christians, this is our message. Jesus does this for people. He heals the broken. You need to go out into this world with a mission this week to go and to take this good news to all who long for salvation, for all who are broken and overwhelmed with sorrow. You need to be like those four men who brought their friend, who carried their friend to salvation and forgiveness. How are you going to do that this week? What new commitments do you need to make? Only Jesus, only Jesus can take broken people from sorrow to celebrating. We need to live with that commitment. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the word that pierces our hearts. Thank you for my friends who are watching online, Lord. I pray over them. I pray over all that are in this room. Lord, I pray that that your son, Jesus, Father, that we would be overwhelmed not by this world, but by the hope that he offers. Pray that we would go from this place on a mission pray that we would not be tempted to go back to our own goodness, our own works, our own deeds, to not be some new form of the Judaizers or some form of of legalists. Father, just to land on Jesus Christ and say, that's that's salvation. It's It's in Christ alone, through Christ alone, and we believe. We believe He has the authority. We believe He is truly God, and only truly God can take away sins against God. Father, I pray even for the one in this room who's not a Christian, but Lord, you're working in their heart right now. You're you're showing them their need. You're showing them, maybe Lord, you're, you're even giving them that desire at this very moment. Lord, I pray over them. I pray that the greatest miracle of all would happen in them today, that you'd transfer them by grace through faith from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your precious Son. Father, we love you. We love this message. May we leave today ready and committed to tell others where to find healing and where to experience true spiritual healing. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.